some people already know me. My name is Chris. Um, some people know me from GitHub or Twitter and the Bergmeister handle, probably with that profile uh, pic in the background. And today I will talk about a range of topics, just have different uh, and interesting things of everything. So one thing will be Azure Pipelines, which is um, a VSTS build and release that some of you know. So I'm guessing some of you guys do continuous integration or continuous deployment or system testing. And you probably use different platforms, maybe use Octopus or TeamCT. So this one is unfortunately specific to VSTS because it's about a feature that VSTS is missing, uh, which is locking of shared resources. So in a development team, we've got a couple of different test suites. And in order to save money, we run them all on the same machine but then we need to basically lock that machine. But there could be also other scenarios where a database um, can't have parallel access to, or maybe MSIs that execute on the same machine that can't be used at the same point in time. So you want to make sure when your build or your release is running, that the thing that has got this single point of access is locked meanwhile you're running. Um, I'll do a few things on the script analyzer. I'll talk about a module and the VSTS extension called PS Code Help that builds on top of it. Um, Injection Hunter is a module made by one of the Microsoft guys, by Lee Holmes, who is responsible for the security of PowerShell itself. And he made a module um, that uses script analyzer to detect dangerous patterns where you could be vulnerable to injection. Um, all of those two topics will cover a bit of VS Code integration, settings files, and then we'll talk a bit about the formatting, how stuff is integrated into VS Code from the VS Script Analyzer side of things, uh, where some people aren't really aware of what is already possible because it's a bit hidden. Um, so all those things will be a bit of a teaser for the PS Day talk. Um, PowerShell 6.1 has been released, and it's so good I don't even need to say PowerShell Core anymore. Where when 6.0 was released, a lot of people were suspicious, oh, less commandlets than Windows PowerShell. Um, yeah, the main advantage why you want to use PowerShell 6.x is it is cross-platform. It is side by side, but some features it still lacks compared to Windows PowerShell but they highly revamped it, so 6.1 is where you should definitely give it a go of trying to move from Windows PowerShell to PowerShell Core. So we'll talk about it in general and features that I added, especially on the Windows side, um, because the PowerShell team has been focusing on this cross-platform experience, um, especially to open up to the Linux community, where I felt the Windows platform wasn't as honored as it used to do, but because it's open source, everyone can contribute, uh, and so did I. And between all of those, I will show some really new bleeding edge stuff. Some of it has been shown on, on Twitter. Two things I will show exclusively that I've custom built um, that aren't fully published yet. So that's just a bit of a teaser. Um, I used it for a really boring slide about who, who am I, but basically I'm a .NET developer, so you could say I live in a dev world. Um, but I want to live more in a DevOpsy world, so I'm focused on CI, CD, automation. Um, I'm into open source, and because of that, it became a maintainer of script analyzer. That was just a coincidence that happened. I was interested in the tool at the time being, um, and I guess Microsoft needed a bit of help for that tool. Um, some people might call me the Banksy of the PowerShell world, because when I started like a year ago, um, I used it as a profile pic, just as a random pick, never changed it, and then I got a bit more famous, and then I was too famous for changing it. But maybe now that I'm an MVP uh, and I'm more publicly facing, I'm thinking maybe next month we'll change it to a picture that people ran, can recognize me better when you see me at meetups or conferences. Um, and two months ago, I got awarded as a Microsoft MVP for the work that I've been doing. And maybe some of you have been asking, like, what has been going on the last one, two months, there wasn't much activity on Twitter or even open source contributions. And the upshot is basically I uh, moved flats. So that was a bit of work that moved in together with my girlfriend who is in the audience today. And but now that we've moved in, there will be more stuff coming up on Twitter. 
new features that will come. Um, so those are my handles. I also have a blog where I occasionally blog. And I will actually start with a topic that I blogged recently, which is that locking aspect in Azure releases. So as I mentioned, there can be resources that can't be uh, accessed in parallel at the same point in time. So we need to lock down when we run our pipelines. And VSTS just doesn't offer a native feature for that. Um, I used to raise the use of us item by, for it, but this will probably take a year. So I had to go ahead and kind of implement a solution myself. And it used a relatively new feature called pre deployment gates, where you can check certain things before you deploy. And before it was only manual things like manual approval. Um, but this is not suitable for something that is automated. So all the details are in my blog, but I'm going to demo it um, in there. So let's see if we can get the link from here. Also, VSTS, or I should call it Azure DevOps now, has changed very much that before it used to be that thing that companies would use because you can have your private repos um, that you wouldn't use for open source. Now we can use it for open source and you can even have a public view. So you can go there as well. Look at the releases that have been running, look at the details. Uh, so that's a fairly new feature that went from preview to release recently in VSTS. If you think about using VSTS for your open source project, so who uses VSTS in general? Many people, quite a few, that's good. How many use the build and release feature? That's quite a lot, so it might be interesting. So in general, if you're interested, you can chat me up and we can talk about various techniques that are found in VSTS from setting up pull requests, triggers, and automatic, automated pipelines. Um, for running different uh, test suites automatically based on path filters and stuff like that. But what I have created here in this release definition is a gate. When we look at here, maybe make it a bit bigger, is that visible? So the gates that we have available or the functions that we can use are a bit limited. We could query for Azure monitor alerts or work items, so that's something internal or the more interesting part is calling a REST API or an Azure function. So in this case, it was simple enough to call the VSTS REST API. If it gets more complex, I would recommend using an Azure function. Azure functions provide different languages and they have PowerShell as a pre-release language. So if you think, oh, I don't want to program something in C-sharp, you actually don't need to for an Azure function. If you just have a couple of scripted lines where you can do your logic, whatever you have to do for returning the information that is queried, you can do that in an Azure PowerShell function. Um, I will just use the REST API because it's just one call, um, but it could go more fancy. So what I needed to create is a generic service connection endpoint. And unfortunately for that generic endpoint, it needs a personal access token, so that means someone will have to maintain that access token it expires after a year. But this allows you calling into APIs and authenticate to the VSTS uh, release APIs. So this is the base API. So if you go to my blog, I will link you up where the documentation for that API is. Um, but using that personal access token that allows me authenticating to such URLs. Because in what I'm going to do is, this is the specific URL uh, suffix that I'm going to query. So I'm going to go get me all the deployments that are in progress and use a specific version of the API. Um, and then when we go to advanced, it comes a bit more complex where you have to set up a condition. When is the gate green? When is it red? So I'm looking for an API response but it could also go for a callback from the REST API. The syntax is not as easy to use as um, you can probably guess, but just looking at it. But what it does is parsing the JSON that we get back. It's going to look for the first property called release environment name, And it's going to assert that it is environment X because that's what I named my environment. Um, environments have been renamed to stages recently. And I'm saying the count should be equal to zero. 
So all I'm saying is environment X, nothing should be running. If there's something running, if it's a red light, you have to wait and continue later on. So when you come to evaluation options, every five minutes, it will query the REST API again. If we have, or it will query until we have zero uh, running releases. So at some point the release will finish. And by the way, five is the minimum. You can't go below five minimum. Um, and you can set more details like timeout after a day where usually something is wrong. That's actually how easy it was. Um, the most difficult part was finding out the syntax because there's really not much documentation around the syntax of it. And we're going to look at it in a demo right now. So release definition two is set up in exactly the same way. Um, and because I'm querying for the environment name, I had to make sure the environment name is the same. You could also define a variable or something else that is unique to it. You could find a couple of variables that are more release gates depending on your usage. In this case, I just want to make sure that release definition one and two, when they're being kicked off in parallel, one waits for the other. So I'm going to start release definition one now. I'm in running. Let's open it in a new tab. Release definition two, I'm going to release now as well. So let's play to the demo gods if it works. So here, this is the release gate. First one got the green light ahead, there was no running release. And it's going to run a PowerShell script that's going to wait for two minutes. So not too interesting. If you go to the second release, it had a red light. So it was seeing the release that was currently running. And in five minutes, it will try again. So we will come back to that and I will continue the presentation. So the idea is query a REST API, do something with it. And then you can actually influence your deployment process quite a lot. And um, basically, for the lack of features that BSDS have in this special area, you can make up for it. And you don't need to really walk around it. Um, you can create your own custom rules. And I found that quite neat because I was looking for such a solution for a long time. Um, so I thought this would be worthwhile sharing. Um, some other beating edge news because we talk about uh, Azure DevOps and uh, what used to be called uh, VSTS. So I'm guessing most of you have used the PowerShell version two task. Um, I've submitted a PR recently that got merged two or three weeks ago. That will, it, it has been merged, but it hasn't been deployed to production yet. But in the next days or weeks, you will see a new checkbox here that will allow you to run PowerShell core natively here. Up until now, you had to run an execute command step and use basically minus command or minus file uh, parameter on the PWSH executable. So this will allow you to run PowerShell core directly as Windows PowerShell as you're used to it and not worry about all the complexity. So watch out for this checkbox. It will be only on the version two tasks. So if you're still on version one of that task runner, you'll have to upgrade to version two, but I'm not aware of breaking changes, so it should be an upgrade for the better. So PowerShell 6.1 has been released. A blog post from the PowerShell team is linked here. Also, what of stuff is new. So basically what has changed is that bugs have been fixed and they're using now a new CLR or a runtime. So the big difference, the reason why it's called PowerShell core, it uses .NET core. So Dotnet Core 2.1 really was released in the meantime, and 2.1 is basically faster. That's how you see it um, in practice in terms of um, seeing the difference. Some commands have been improved, but it's mainly the speed difference why you want to be on Dotnet Core 2.1. Um, hardly any breaking changes, so I don't think we need to worry about this. The support for ARM from the Microsoft side for Dotnet Core was made official. So for 2.0, Core 2.0, it was experimental. Uh, and I've seen it, although some guys were already running PowerShell Core and Raspberry Pis, I was using a different device that was ARM-based as well, which couldn't run um, Raspbian. It has to run Debian 9, so vanilla Debian, not like Raspbian, which is a customized version of it. And when I was running PowerShell 6, it was crashing after 10 seconds. 
with 6.1 it was working. So that must definitely be T2.2.1 now officially being supported and well tested. Um, the PowerShell team had a big effort of adding more command lists to it to have parity with Windows PowerShell. Part of that also concerns the security where it wasn't too much talked about that some security features were actually missing in 6.0 compared to Windows PowerShell. Now we do have parity between them. Um, some nice things that have been asked for a long time and finally got merged is that update help can now run without having to elevate your command shells, which is very nice if you have automation scenarios where you don't have admin privileges. Uh, and sometimes it's just annoying having to open an admin shell just for updating the help. Um, there was a bug in 6.0 where PowerShell.exe was hard coded in the code, so you couldn't remote into, power, into a PowerShell core container because as, um, some, some of you might know the invoke command commandlet offers an option to remote into a running container, and this is basically what was affected. So when it remote into a container, <coughs> it was looking for PowerShell.exe as a hard coded string, and now you have the option and it prefers PowerShell core if it can find it in, in the container. Uh, so I'll show a couple of features that I did. I worked a lot on the MSI, making sure that the upgrades work well. There were a few bugs in there. Some of them were last minute fixes. Um, I added a feature that was in Windows PowerShell back into PowerShell core. And this was a really tough task. I um, had to get the legacy code out from a branch that they have left over and had to convert old C++ code to .NET managed code. And I will show in a bit what that, some, everyone is familiar with it, but some of you might have not noticed that this feature is actually missing in core. And the feature that has emerged is location history. So a lot of Linux guys are used to CD, doing a CD minus to going to the last location. This is now available in PowerShell 6.1. You can also do CD minus minus for going to the PS home directory. I submitted a pull request for CD plus that actually got merged only yesterday which means it's not in 6.1, it will be in 6.2. So something to look forward to. So let's have a look at PowerShell 6.04. So this was the old version. Um, from PowerShell, you used to right click, run as admin. In PowerShell core, we didn't have that functionality. Uh, what the PowerShell had done for Windows PowerShell is implement something that is calling the Windows API, and it was actually quite complex, and it wasn't .NET code. So that's why this code wasn't ported for PowerShell Core. Um, and in 6.1, you will see we will have that feature. Um, the reason why I still have 6.0 installed is because you want to make you aware how the upgrade process works. So if we go to the installer that we have here, So this is just a standard license agreement, a standard dialogue. So I've added this new dialogue. This dialogue wasn't there in 6.0. It offers you things like, by default, it adds PowerShell to the environment variable so that from a different shell, it knows where PWSH is. That's the same way when you type git. The reason why git works is because git is on the path and it then knows where git.exe lives. So this is what this checkbox is doing and why it makes sense to be picked by default. Um, um, the Windows event log and manifest is basically for allowing you to log to the event logs, and but there needs to be some registration. And this is a post installation event that is run as perf installation, but still after the deployment. So this one uh, will make sure this works as well. Some of you might know there's an enable PS remoting commandlet so this is basically calling enable PS remoting after the installation for you so that you can remote straight after the installation. Because there's many scenarios, this is just calling it without any parameters. So depending on the environment, this will not set up your environment sufficiently. If you have a very simple environment, this will be enough. Um, so that's why the option is there. It's an easy PC option that stuff works out of the box once you've installed it. This uh, context menu I will demo after the installation, that makes more sense. Um, so let's tick this. So next, so remember I had 
open for installs, I'm going to go install it. And you see removing files. So what is it doing? It's going to remove 6.0 because it's an upgrade install. <coughs> so there was an RFC, which is part of the engineering process of Microsoft to define what the behavior should be. And the result was at the time being, people don't care if they use 6.0 or 6.1. So installing 6.1 will remove 6.0. You can have only one version of PowerShell installed via MSI. It's still side by side. If you want to use 6.0 and 6.1, use the zip. The MSI means using one version only, which at least simplifies patching and updating scenarios. Um, the experience in the past was people using the .NET SDK, .NET Core SDK, which was side by side by side. You end up having like 15, 20 versions of the SDK, clogging up your disk space. You don't even know, do I need this one? Is some program using this one? So the idea was to simplify the use case. So now I don't have 6.0 anymore, but I have 6.1. A checkbox that I added to install as well. Launch PowerShell straight away. I don't even have to find it. It opens it up for me. There we go, 6.1. So um, let's have a look here. If I right click, we have run as admin. Yay. Saves us two extra clicks. The context menu that I was talking about. So if this is Explorer, um, I can right click and it's basically this sub menu here where I can open PowerShell and then it opens me partial in this um, location. What you see here is a leftover from the preview days, um, which will come in handy when you will see it for the next previews. So I disambiguated the icons, so the previews will have those icons instead of the black ones. Um, and if you're using the daily build, it will have this icon. So much for that tool. Uh, I forgot to mention the CD, so let's give it a demo of the CD feature. So how does CD work? So say I go to my C drive, and then I want to actually want to go back, or let's see if we've got another folder here. So let's do CD Windows. So I changed my mind. Let's go back just to see. Oh, actually, I want to go back once more. Go back, so it goes back up to 20 locations. There was actually a long discussion of what the number should be. The, the result was 20 to reduce the memory footprint. Um, in the future, we will be able to CD plus in the next uh, version. Not now, but in 6.2. Um, CD minus minus. So say if I CD C again, and CD minus minus will get you to PS home. That cover, which I think I find quite handy because we CD quite a lot around. Uh, and especially Linux people are so used to that. And it was one of those blog posts when they first saw PowerShell Core and, and started using it. Oh, it's similar like the Linux commands, but oh, it doesn't do CD minus. So that's what I brought back, which was quite interesting in terms of learning about the internals of PowerShell, um, where you see more of the engine and how it interacts with uh, directories. So um, a prototype that I have, I have a public branch, but I haven't shared this publicly uh, yet before. Okay, so this is a private build that I did of PowerShell. So some people um, remember Power, Windows PowerShell up to 5.1 was using the full CLR, and then Microsoft started to work on making it cross-platform. So there is a version of 5.1 that is using the core CLR that is available in the nano server image of the Docker uh, image that they still have uh, um, public. But then they released 6.0 with the core CLR and there's a pragma. So pragma is a conditional uh, compile statement for the core CLR. So if I look at the source code right now, it's a mix between core CLR and full CLR and they want to deprecate the full CLR code. So for the, as a proof of concept, I enabled the full CLR code again, and oh. I had to do tweaks to compile it against full.net. So basically what I'm showing here is, this is a .full.net 4.7.2 app, where 
you couldn't call the 6.1 APIs because they're .NET Core. And references is SMA, so System Management Automation, which is the heart of PowerShell. And we should see version 6.1, so if we do F5 and run it, this one actually works, so we're running full.NET using the PowerShell parser and parsing a PowerShell script. Um, so this is for system that management that automation only as one caveat. So if people want to create a run space, this isn't working yet. Uh, the reason why I created it is because I wanted to separate out the parser. So if you have a full.NET app that has a dependency on PowerShell and on Windows PowerShell and you want to remove that dependency, the idea is now ship this self-contained version so you're not depending on Windows PowerShell anymore if you only need to use the parser APIs. So this was the intention behind it. Um, there is a GitHub issue on it where we had a bit of a discussion and the upshot is that maybe the pull request won't get merged in. Instead, we will go for using .NET standard and with .NET standard, once we go for .NET standard 2.0 or 2.1, um, we will be able to compile against full.NET again. So it will take a while until this will be in master, but this is the future ahead. And if you want to fork whatever I did, feel free to, I can share some information about it. I thought it was very interesting and exciting actually seeing that old Windows PowerShell code alive again, it's still working. Um, so that we could use those side-by-side -side features um, again in full.NET. Um, I'll briefly talk about various peer script analyzer things. So integrations and extensions. So via Twitter, um, I got to know about PS Code Health. Um, and Injection Hunter, there was a blog post by the PowerShell team, I think about a month ago, so we'll talk about that. And all of that will always involve a bit of VS Code integration. So let's start with Injection Hunter first. So I think usually we've got a mix of people. You've got developers, we've got admins, we probably have a lot of SQL people today. So I'm guessing most of you are familiar with SQL injection and there's various injection techniques and injection techniques can also be present in PowerShell. So imagine you write a module that at some point is calling invoke expression. So invoke expression will invoke the string that you pass it to as is. And if there's a parameter being passed into it, and this parameter is coming from the user, unfiltered, not being verified or validated against, then this is basically open to injection where you could inject malicious code. And sometimes when hackers do that, they don't use the obvious APIs, they use sneaky little side and back doors where it's not obvious that there is an injection vulnerability. And Lee Holmes is responsible for the security of PowerShell from the Microsoft side of things. And he created a couple of custom peer script analyzer rules, which he wrapped up as a module published to the PowerShell gallery. So you can just save module or install module of Injection Hunter. And all it will do, to, uh, it will save those custom rules there. To use them, you either use the Invoke Script Analyzer APIs or what I will show you, the uh, DBS code integration because usually you look at code and want to, you want to see it live when you see the squid is like, are you sure you want to do that? So I'll give a demo of this. Injection enter, so what I have here in my .vs code folder, my settings, I have defined a script analyze six settings path, which points, it just says peer script analyzer.psd1 which takes the directory where the VS Code directory lives and looks for this file. You could specify a full path, relative path, but I think this is the easiest way of having a repository, having everything at the root um, and not having to use hard-coded paths so it works on any machine if someone checks out your repository. And settings files basically allow you to define um, the parameters that VS Code will use to call into a peer script analyzer by default, it uses a special custom set, which is a set of reduced rules. Actually by design, you want to have at least settings file that looks a bit like this, just empty. 
because by default VS Code en enables only 10 or 15 rules. Um, I don't know the design reasoning for it, but for me, why would you not enable all of them, get them for free? So what I've done here is um, custom rule path is a parameter that allows you to point to a PowerShell module or binary that defines your custom rules. So it's pointing to that injection handler module. Unfortunately, that's a feature that should come in the future at some point, is to allow you to specify relative paths and possibly even look up the installed modules. Because as you can see, this is a full path, so this will not work on every machine. So it would be nice to have an option that you specify the module name and it looks it up in the available uh, modules. Uh, this is not there yet, but at least you can configure it like this for the moment. And I have here a script um, that does a couple of things. So let's have a look at the module that I've installed. It has a, a couple of rules. So those are the rules that are available. And PS Script Analyzer already has a rule for invoking expression because this is one of the naughtiest APIs. Um, so you can hover over it and see the details of it. So the first one comes from um, the second one comes from invoke script, script analyzer itself. The first one is the custom rule, so the one that Lee Holmes made, which is telling us, be careful, it could be a script injection risk. Um, the same goes for add type, um, because someone could compile the net code and PowerShell when you do an import module. You can also do it on a DLL, call the methods in that DLL. That's as fast as you can execute code, which could be any code that could be written by a hacker. And creating script box is very similar to invoke expression where script box have an invoke method to allow you to invoke arbitrary code. You don't want to invoke that kind of code. So it's giving you the warning on this. So if you want to scan your code base against it, it's better to use maybe the command line of your script analyzer. But it's very nice that Lee Holmes made that module for us, those custom rules. Maybe in the next version, we'll maybe ship it out of the box. At the moment you have to install it and configure like that. Um, and it's given details about that in his blog post that you can read if you're interested. So those are the commands. Not the interesting news item. So this one has been public. So Tyler is a developer in the PowerShell team who works on the user experience on VS Code side. So how many people, I, I guess it's probably divided half and half. I guess half the people use VS Code for PowerShell. Most people, and I myself, start switching to the IC when it comes to debugging PowerShell code. The editor experience is great, um, but what I've been missing is PS Readline. And some people don't know what is PS Readline. Um, the way how I explain it is, if you remember when we went from PowerShell 4 to 5, um, and suddenly we had those colors in there, those colors came from PS Readline. It also allows you to have the up-down navigation and a ton of features that prove the, pro improve the editing experience. Um, what, what, what I was personally missing in the VS Code extension is the history tab. So you debug, you want to try your last command. No, you can't, you have to type it all again. So there's a pull request open and there will be a version two of the PowerShell extension. So two meaning breaking change. There will not be a support for PowerShell version 3 and 4 anymore because they're moving fast forward. But this new version will give you PS read line. So I've created here a gist with a couple of code lines that will basically install you that, either in code or in insiders. I like to try bleeding edge stuff only in insiders so I don't corrupt my production environment because it's bleeding edge. There could be bugs in there. You only want to use it for playing around. So we've got here a breakpoint. F9 sets a breakpoint. If we do F5 on it, let's see if the demo works. It's coming in there. It's taking its time. So you can see some of the artifacts here. So that thing it still had there, but now we've got a shell. So we could query for stuff. And now I can navigate up and down, which is what we couldn't do before. But this is a bug, as you can obviously see, but we get some of the functionality. So we can also do the type extension, type completion. 
and well, everything that you want from PS read lines. You can see it's bleeding edge, there's bugs in there. So expect the release maybe in one or two months. The guys have been harding work have been working very hard on this. So it's just a matter of time until version 2.0 gets released. So the main pull request has been merged in already. We are just testing and tweaking um, little things to squash out all the bugs. This code help is a wraparound script analyzer, plus it adds a ton of other warnings and validations against it, uh, which is quite nice. The documentation is super extensive, so I encourage you to check it out. So just look, a look at the table, you can see plenty of stuff to do. Um, so I encourage you to write a check it out. I will do a demo, so it is available as a module to call it. It can produce a HTML report to look at it. There is a VSTS extension that you can use. I'm demoing this in, a, in an environment that is publicly available as well. Um, and you can have a look at the definition. It's super easy to define. All I do here is partial code analysis, defaults, didn't specify anything apart from generate me an HTML report. Um, I'm specifying a path here because afterwards I'm uploading it. That's it, there is not much more to it. It handles the installation of PS Script Analyzer. And let's have a look at the result. So with the links to it, you can also view this on the publicly available one. So let's go artifact, drop, channel, download. Yep, we want that. Really nice and fancy UI. Or you can drill down into your details and you can configure a lot of, you can configure thresholds and stuff like that. So really nice. So this would be just one presentation talking about this. I just want to show you, this is out there. If you're interested, try it out, give it a go. Um, I've tried it out on example repositories. It's interesting when I tried it on the PS script analyzer repo, it actually crashed. So there might be some bugs in there, but for simple repositories, it has worked for me. Um, I think he's happy to help out. He's on Twitter and very active. Um, so I want to promote that module. Um, and I want to tease a bit about the PS script analyzer talks we've seen. You can define settings files. You can define custom rules. So we'll talk about all of that and we'll go into much more, to more detail how you can configure, customize it, do exactly what you want to do. One of the teasers was as well, so we have different versions of PowerShell for legacy reasons, and sometimes it needs to work for a couple of versions, and let me give you an example scenario. A client was asking me, can we write me a PowerShell module or a script that does X, Y, Z? And the example was creating a zip file. Okay, compressed archive is there. I told him, call compressed archive and we offer basically an envir environment to run PowerShell. So the user doesn't, well, unless they're interested, they don't care or don't know which version of PowerShell they're running. So we um, just ran a compressed archive and then bang, didn't work because the engine was in uh, version four. So you have to test all versions. Yes, it would be great, but sometimes you want to know quickly, like have a smoke test, will this work on version four or not? And there is a feature in PS Script Analyzer that is not enabled by default because you have to configure it. And I will tell you how to do that. So to show you the example use case, compress archive, Script Analyzer tells us it is not available in version four, which we are targeting. So I'm telling Script Analyzer via the settings that we see here. I want to run it on version four and 6.0. Version 5.1 is always included by default. I will go into details why that is the case. Um, so this is how you get warnings already before you even run the code. It does it, not just the command name, also the parameters. So if a parameter has been added, removed, renamed, whatever, it will also tell you about this. So that's why we expect a PS script analyzer release soon. So we can cover the new commands that are available in 6.1. Um, not yet there, so it will take a bit of time. Um, I will also show you if you publish the PS gallery, 
you might get an email after you've published telling you, oh, there's some warnings in there, can you fix them or have a look at them, evaluate them. Um, you can actually check before you publish. Um, you can even do this from command line. Let me show you that quickly. Script analyzer ships with a couple of files. So when I will be talking about formatting, there is a couple of built-in uh, settings and rules that it ships with. So if we go for the settings parameter of tab, tab complete, there's actually quite a lot of tab completion in script analyzer. So some of them are formatting, code formatting, OTPS, which stands for one true brace style. Ooh -hoo. There's going to be a di big discussion where the braces go. Um, so the one for the PS gallery runs the rules that the PS gallery is using, and we're actually updating those rules. There have been a couple of PRs as they add or remove um, certain PS uh, script analyzer warnings um, for various reasons. So this way, when you run script analyzer, those will be the, the, the rules that the PS gallery uses. I will talk about some internals. Um, give details about rules, why sometimes they can be false positives. Um, I could tell you how to build it, debug it, um, run it on Linux. It, on Linux it works as is, by the way, when you install it. Should also work on Mac OS. Um, have them tested on ARM, but probably, you probably tell me if you're interested in running that. And there will be a section about known issues. So the tool is not perfect, that's just what software is. There's known issues, there's also a roadmap where I want to go, where Microsoft wants to go. So I'll be talking about this, um, but it will be mainly, I will talk about some of the items that I have on my list, and from the Microsoft side, I can already tell you it will be a focus on the cross-platform perspective and enhancing the experience of knowing if a uh, command that is working in a cross-platform fashion. So it will be an extension to that existing rule that I showed where can you run it on this version of PowerShell? It will be extended to, can you run it on this platform? Um, so it will be a big enhancement from their side. Um, as we're going to eight o'clock and we're going to have pizza break soon, I'll only briefly talk about um, VS Code PSA settings. So you have seen already the settings files, what you can do in every instance of VS Code. Um, Control Shift P, let's go to settings, workspace settings, and you can search for it PowerShell.code formatting. Let's see what comes up there. So there's a couple of rules that I've listed here. So what those rules are, they're mappings for calling invoke formatter, which is a command line uh, command that um, gets exported from script analyzer as well that most people actually don't really use from the command line because it's more made for the editor. And here you can define how VS Code will format or auto-format your code. So I'm just looking for my instance where this instance where I want to demo it. So the default one will say braces on the same line because the way the uh, partial syntax works is there are scenarios, for example, script blocks, where the brace has to be in the same line. So that's why that's the default. You can write code like this, which works, which people prefer, especially if they're from a C-sharp background, uh, but you can auto-format this. So if I select this, press Control KF, it auto-formats me the code, and this is calling invoke formatter. If I don't like it, I can customize it. So um, there are like a couple of, let's go to this one here. This one is the preset setting. So there's four ones that define you the most four common use cases, which is Ullman, one true brace trial, or true stroop. So one cell means brace on the same line. The next cell means brace on the same line, but uh, what they call cuddle braces. Um, if you want to know the details about that, I encourage you to check out that link where you see actually examples. See if you can see that. So Ullman looks a bit like this. And you can see people upvoting, downvoting it, but it's just a style preference. There's no right and wrong. That's why you can customize it. This is the so-called one true brace style. Um, so here you can see the cuddle braces where the else is on the same line. I don't prefer that in terms of readability. I want to have it on the same indentation, but some people like it. 
um, people who come from the C or side or Linux side of things. Um, but it's just personal preference. So those files and settings ship as part of the installation. You can actually look at them if you go into the installation folder. You see the settings folder. And those PSD1 files are basically settings files. That's all they are. They define rules. Um, and rules at the moment in Script Analyzer are mixed between like code style rules and code, or what you call it, code design rules or code, let me call it code, code warning rules that warn you about how you use the code and code style okay. rules, which is just which style you prefer. And this is basically how you would, um, how one rule has been formed. So you could tweak this, you could create your own rule and those are the individual rules that you could tweak with certain settings. You can say, I want this to be slightly different. I want four or three spaces, customize it yourself. Um, so I will talk a bit about this, but you've basically already seen the gist. That's how it works under the hood. That's how you can create your own style and make it consistent. Um, you can also auto format all of them if you, li if you like to um, by running the invoke format to commandlet. And I think it's time for the pizza break. So uh, that's the last slide. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them or during the break. And want to thank everyone for being there and uh, your attention and hope it was a bit interesting. So do you if I just don't I have like a PowerShell enable on the PowerShell? We're talking about the PowerShell MSI? Yeah. Um, so if you want to call them by command then there's a minus Q option for MSI exec. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's MSI parameters. I can point you to a issue in docs repo where I document those parameters. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually find them very easily in source control. Um, so the installer for PowerShell is defined in the assets file. It's a Wix installer and the file is called products.wxs where you will find those properties if you look for them. So if we go <coughs> search, so this would be for the context menu, the property that you pass in via the slash Q mode, then you could install it using this option via command line. Okay, then if there's no more questions, then it would open up for the pizza break. Thank you.